Long Row Peated Single Malt Scotch Whiskey does not have an age statement. So is it any good? Let's drink this whiskey. Hey guys, and thank you for joining me on Whiskey on the West Coast. My name is Matt, and today we're gonna to be talking about the Long Row Peated Non-Age Statement Single Malt Scotch Whiskey from the Springbank Distillery in Campbelltown. Now, Long Row is the heavily peated, twice distilled version of the Springbank Distillate. So it's, it's peated to about 50 phenol parts per million, whereas regular Springbank is two and a half times distilled and is uh, peated, I think, around 12 to 15 uh, ppm. And the Hazelburn distillate is triple distilled and is unpeated. So there's there's three primary uh, unique spins on the Springbank distillate. This is one of them, is the heavily peated version. Now, uh, it was first released in 2012, um, uh, this version, the non-age statement version. And I think one of the reasons why it's non-age statement is because of limited stocks, they like to vat and blend different ages together to get a particular profile uh, to help keep uh, a largely consistent profile to this bottling. And, and the reason why I say this is because I came across some information um, from Surge from Whiskey Fun. Uh, it was, a, I mean, one of the most famous whiskey reviewers out there. And he mentioned that it's actually made up of um, seven to 14 year old whiskeys, at least the batch that he had. Um, which is fascinating. So I understand why they wouldn't just want to slap a, a seven year age statement on this because it doesn't quite do it justice if there's whiskeys that are twice that age involved. Now it's largely ex bourbon casts, if not entirely. And uh, the first modern long row spirit was distilled in 1973 and released in the 1980s. And the reason why I mention that is because Long Row is actually a distillery that used to exist in Campbelltown, much like I talked about how Hazelburn was a distillery that used to exist uh, in Campbelltown as well. Um, so we see a theme here, Springbank naming whiskeys after former distilleries, kind of like a, as an homage or a, a tribute to them. Same deal with Long Row. Now, it was, a, uh, it was a whiskey that was made to reflect a style of whiskey uh, that was popular during the height of Campbelltown during the Victorian era. Um, and so for that reason, it, it actually has a, a, it's particularly characterful uh, and, and I enjoy it for that reason. And just like Hazelburn, it only accounts for about 10% of the distillate every year that's made at the Springbank Distillery. So about 80% of what Springbank makes is just Springbank, 10% Hazelburn, 10% Long Row. So I'd love to get into some of the history of the original Long Row Distillery, and then we'll jump into the review. Now, the original Long Row Distillery was founded in 1824 by John Ross, which was actually four years before Springbank itself was founded in 1828. Now, it was named after Long Row Street, which was one of the most important streets in Campbelltown and had multiple other distilleries on it. Uh, now, when Alfred Barnard uh, visited when he was writing his uh, whiskey distilleries of the United Kingdom, when he was touring um, United, United Kingdom, to research that book. Um, he visited in 1885 and there was actually 21 operational distilleries in Campbelltown at that time, which is an incredible amount. I couldn't imagine if there was 21 distilleries still making whiskey in Campbelltown. Maybe we'll see it again someday. Um, he met John Ross, the founder, when he was 85 years old and it was speculated he may even be the oldest living distiller in Scotland at that time. It was producing about 40,000 gallons per year which I believe is quite a bit less than Hazelburn um, was, uh, was producing around the same time. But really interesting to know. Um, and he was producing 40,000 gallons from just two pot stills. Now, the next year after Barnard's visit in 1886, John Ross passed away, uh, but the distillery was taken over by another crew. However, the older equipment in the distillery and the inability to expand the distillery um, put a lot of constraints on that distillery uh, because again, it was just located in a part of town where they couldn't make the building larger and they couldn't really increase production to a point where they can make it, I guess, sustainable. So these factors led to the closure of the Long Road Distillery 10 years after John Ross's death in 1896. Um, 
Now, it was actually the only the second distillery to close in Campbelltown at that point in 40 years. So this was before uh, the big crash in Campbelltown distilleries. Now, the only remaining building of Long Row today is actually the former warehouse, which is now the bottling plant for Springbank. Uh, it's, 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 the, it's where they, they actually go ahead and they would have bottled this whiskey right beside me here, which is pretty cool. It's really neat to think that there's some remnants of the Long Row Distillery still out there. And in fact, this Long Row was bottled in the form warehouse of the Long Row Distillery. So that's really cool. Let's get to the review. Okay, so some of the vital stats on this bottle before we jump into this. 46%, it's non-chill filtered, it's natural colored, it's bottled at Springbank, all the things that you that we already know about Springbank and love. Uh, largely ex-bourbon casks. And again, it is at 50 phenol parts per million, 50 ppm. It's on the nose. Mm. Some smoked bacon and like, well, already there's like a, a Campbelltown funk, like an oily, like industrial machine shops or a note. Oh yeah, I love that. Sometimes the funk goes a little cheesy too, like a salted cheese, but... But one of the things that's lovely about Long Row, it's, it's a very fruity peated whiskey, like apples and melon, honey. But there's like some seashell like minerality too. There's a bit of earthiness. Um, again, there's, this, there's that smoked nature to it, but even though it's 50 ppm, it's not overbearing it's not overtaking there's so much to this whiskey it's not just a smoke show yeah dirty yet fruity whiskey for sure the peat smoke dominates a little bit near the beginning but the more you know is it the more it, it opens up and it becomes more lively yeah it's really fruity it's like um it's like a syrupy can of like Del Monte, like uh, fruit cocktail. Like, like uh, I used to get those in my lunches sometime as a kid. Oh man. But again, that funk is there. It's like there's diesel fumes at the, the gas station. Uh, like someone's like just fueled their diesel truck or something. Like it, it's like that and they're, they're taking off. Yeah, I love that funk. Once you're past the smoke, you're left with fruit and funk. And I, I just, I really enjoy that. All right, let's take a step. So peat smoke, um, some diesel, but it's sweet, sweet honey. Peat smoke, some syrup from that tin fruit, that uh, Del Monte fruit cup. Hmm. Bit of like maybe a touch of like black pepper um, prickle, like on the just the outsides of my tongue. Oh. But the fruits are there too. Again, that melon, that cantaloupe, green apple. And there's a nice body to this. And like when, when you just uh, swirl it around a bit, just gently in your glass, and you look at the legs, like. Yeah, it's, it's clinging nicely. Hmm. Yeah, that peat smoke, that diesel fume, sort of Campbell Town funk. It builds as you chew. Bit earthy, some like cold smoke peat. Um, very enjoyable profile, really. It's, it's something that just invites another sip. Might be a little touch of like smoked meat in there, like Montreal smoked meat. Yeah, really enjoyable. It's not uh, like a deep thinker whiskey, uh, but it's something that you can just pour and, and enjoy right away. Campbelltown Funk is certainly on display like more than say like with Hazelburn. Um, but I oftentimes do find that heavy peating can obscure it a little bit. And so I think the best whiskey if you're looking for Campbelltown Funk is definitely Springbank, so Springbank 10, Springbank 15, so on and so forth. Um, probably the cleanest version of that is going to be from Springbank 10. 
yeah, the peat, peat can obscure it a bit, but uh, it this does not come off as 50 ppm. This comes off closer to somewhere like 20 to 25. Um, yeah, it doesn't come off as heavily peated as as it is. But again, that that measurement's taken before they distill the uh, distill the spirit, right? That's taken from the grain as opposed to the the spirit that comes off the still. So um, obviously, they lose some of that those some of those phenols in making the whiskey. All right, another sip here. Yeah, that's a really enjoyable palette. On the finish, you get some funky malt, um, smoke and some coastal elements. The, the, the finish is the most coastal part for me. It feels like an old style of whiskey, which is great because that's what they were going for. They were going for that Victorian era style Campbelltown whiskey. Makes total sense that that's the way it would profile. Uh, it's something not so refined, but more elemental, rough around the edges, um, but enjoyable in that character. Um, it's funky, got a smoky finish. I'm still tasting it right now. Um, with that coastal element in there, maybe like a touch of like smoked sockeye salmon, uh, I, I'd get in there. Yeah, that the smoked meat note with the, the funk and the coastal element. I, I, I could see that for sure. It's a really unique take on an entry level Peter. Um, and being neither from Isla, it's not from the Highlands where you know you get a lot of them get their peated malts from Baird's maltings. It's not from Isla where they a lot of them get it from Port Ellen. It's its own thing, which is why I think having a long row on the shelf for any peat fan is really important because it is a different take on a peated whiskey. And it's one of the few Springbank products which oftentimes is left lurking on the shelves. Uh, Springbank flies, and behind that, uh, Hazelburn and Longrose seem to lag, at least in, in my market. Um, they definitely don't uh, go running off the shelves at the same pace. So, if we're talking score on this, I'm gonna give this an 88 out of 100. Uh, I know I've given that score a few times, but um, this, this is a really great whiskey. It, it, again, it has a place on any Pete fan's shelf. Um, and I think I enjoy it just a little bit more than the Hazelburn. Uh, the Hazelburn I gave 87. If you want to check out that review, go check it out. It's only a couple reviews ago. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, I turn to it more often than I do Hazelburn. Um, and for that reason, yeah, 88 points. It's a great value too. I got this bottle back in 2020. This is a 2020 bottling if you guys are interested. Uh, the 3820 bottling code. Uh, I got it for about $70. I could still pick up Hazelburns for between, not Hazelburns, Long Rose for anywhere between like $80 to $100 in my market. Uh, they're not too, too hard to get out of Alberta. Um, with that, guys, thank you for joining me on Whiskey on the West Coast. Um, question for you, what is your favorite version of Springbank. Is it Hazelburn, the unpeated? Is it Long Row, the heavily peated? Or are you just a fan of regular, moderately peated Springbank discs? Let me know what your favorite style is down below. And uh, let me know if you like the video. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe. You can like uh, or share. Uh, I really appreciate it. It really helps with uh, getting these videos out to wider audiences and uh, making sure the channel's doing well. Until next time, guys, once again, thanks for joining me on the West Coast. Sláinte.